It is now my pleasure to introduce our next presenters. Jacob Love and Ms. Baanis from Crawford, Chondon and Partners LLC will be presenting on episodic disability and the law. Jacob, who uses he, him pronouns, takes a practical approach to resolving workplace issues. He understands that every workplace is different and he works with both unionized and non-union employers to craft workplace solutions tailored to each client's unique needs. Ms. Baanis, who uses she, her pronouns, joined CC Partners as an associate in 2023 after completing her articles at a prominent labor and employment firm in Toronto. Ms. Ba advises and represents clients on a wide range of labor and employment issues, including employment contracts and policies, discipline and termination, human rights, and labor relations. I am going to hand it over to Mesba and Jacob. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, go ahead and share your slides. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mesba, and I'm here today with my colleague, Jacob Love. We're associates at CC Partners, a management side labor and employment law firm. We are lawyers for employers, and we represent and advise businesses on all of their workplace law issues. So we're happy to be presenting to you today on episodic disability and the duty to accommodate. In this presentation, we're going to provide you with a primer on episodic disabilities, some of which you've probably already Ms. heard. Ba, this is Tammy. Can you speak just a little slower for the interpreters? Thank you. Yes, definitely. So in this presentation, we're going to provide you with a primer on episodic disabilities and then some fundamental legal background to the concept of accommodation and the workplace. Just a disclaimer for our presentation today, we are not providing any legal advice. And I would just like to highlight that every workplace accommodation plan is different, but certain fundamental principles will remain the same. And that's basically the topic of our discussion today. So just going through our agenda in terms of what we'll be covering, We'll do a quick primer on episodic disabilities and what they are and some challenges associated with them. We will then move on to the employer's duty to accommodate, the employee's duties in this accommodation process, how to accommodate episodic disabilities, what some limits are on accommodation. Then we will go into some case law regarding instances where employers have been found to fail in their duty to accommodate. And then with the time left over, we'll take any questions that you have. So some of this has been discussed before, but just to kind of provide a very quick primer, uh, what are episodic disabilities? So these are defined as disabilities involving periods of good health that alternate with periods of bad health or illness. They can include things like mental illness, epilepsy, HIV, and some types of cancers as well. So they're episodic in nature in that they're not permanent disabilities, but rather they're periodic or unpredictable. Many episodic disabilities are invisible to employers or hidden in some way until they become so severe. So it's harder to gauge when an employee is struggling with a disability if they themselves don't bring it forward. Accommodating employees with episodic disabilities presents a challenge for employers as they have to try to balance complying with legislation to protect the individual's private health information. And at the same time, receiving that information that would benefit receiving information to meet that worker support needs. So the Ontario Human Rights Code provides that every person has a right to equal treatment with respect to employment without discrimination based on various grounds. And one of these grounds includes disability. This means employers are legally obligated to accommodate an employee in order to provide this equal treatment. So what does accommodation really mean? It's the process of modifying the workplace or terms of a person's employment to prevent a discriminatory outcome. It's to allow employees to perform the essential duties of their job with dignity, individualization, and inclusion. 
Accommodation is a process. It's not always an easy solution. Sometimes it requires trial and error and going back and forth with the employer and employee to reach a proper accommodation. The accommodations may also change over time as the condition for the employee improves or deteriorates. The goal of accommodation is to reasonably accommodate the employee, but the accommodation also has to result in the employee performing productive work or at least fulfilling their essential duties of the position. There is no right for employees to be paid for no work or no productive work. And the employer is also not required to make up work for this employee if it doesn't exist as part of their normal duties. Employees are entitled to reasonable accommodations in the circumstances. However, this means that they're not entitled to a perfect or preferred form of accommodation. It's, they're just entitled to one that meets their needs and the employer's needs to operationally run their business. So accommodation is a multi-party process, which means all parties have a role to play in the employee receiving the proper accommodations. So just to highlight which party is responsible for what in this process. Generally, the employer is responsible for modifying the workplace or work assignments to meet the employee's needs. The employee, on the other hand, is responsible for disclosing their need for accommodation, as well as any restrictions or limitations they have. If there is a union involved, if you're working in a unionized environment, then the union representative is also responsible for facilitating the accommodation. However, it's important to keep in mind that accommodation is the employer's responsibility. And if they fail to accommodate or engage in the process, they can face consequences. Employers will not be held responsible, however, if they are trying to accommodate and engage in that process, and the employee or the union are not cooperating. In some cases, an employer has a duty to inquire about a possible disability that they may think the employee has, but generally it is the employee's duty to disclose their disability. In unionized workplaces, employers also have to involve the union as a participant in the accommodation process. So just diving a little bit deeper into the duties for employers and employees. The employer's duties consist of inquiring into the need for accommodation if they think a disability exists and the employee has not brought it forward. Employers have to accept accommodation requests and medical information in good faith, which means being cooperative, not making assumptions. Employers have to investigate alternative approaches to accommodation to see what can work for the business and the employee. And employers are required to maintain confidentiality in terms of medical information they receive and ensure they're only seeking information they absolutely need and sharing that information with only those people that need to be involved to facilitate the accommodation. Finally, employers need to assess and disclose undue hardship since the employer is in the best position to know what kind of accommodations will be reasonable given the costs and safety concerns of the business. They need to be open and honest when they think an accommodation will constitute undue hardship. Uh, Jacob will discuss a little bit more in detail later on what undue hardship entails. Moving on to the employee's duties in this process, employees also have a duty to disclose their need to their employer uh, when looking for accommodations. In doing so, they have to provide objective information regarding their restrictions and limitations and this could include anything like a doctor's note, hospital visit, documentation, therapist notes, et cetera. Employees need to cooperate in the accommodation process. This means making best efforts to perform productive work, attempting possible modifications if it's safe to do so, asking questions, answering questions by the employer, and remembering that it is a process to reach an accommodation. Employees must also accept reasonable accommodation. 
they are not entitled to perfect or preferred accommodation and may have to accept some hardships. Finally, employees have to meet work standards once the accommodations are in place. Those work standards should be discussed so the employee knows the standard to meet and knows that performance management is possible if they deviate too far from the standard. I will pass it off now to my colleague Jacob to take you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Uh So now I'm just gonna move on to talking about um, providing medical information. Um, so of course, when looking for accommodation of this disability, the employer, the employee needs to provide information. That's really the only basis that the employer has to know what accommodations they need to implement. Um, and in most cases, an employer will have the right to confirm that there is a need to accommodate. Um, and of course, the employer needs to be very flexible with the potential accommodations. Um, and this could include, say, flexible work schedules or workstation modifications. Um, those are very common, what we see for uh, episodic disabilities. Um, so instead of, say, a rigid nine to five um, Monday to Friday schedule, you could consider working from home on certain days or on occasion, working evenings and weekends if the employee is too ill to work during the day. Um, you could The employer could also adjust the starts and break times. Um, and often what we see as part of, say, graduated return to work plans is um, uh, the employer offers additional breaks to the employee. So it's just, just a reminder that both parties have um, and just both parties need to participate and also be flexible in, in the accommodation process. Um, so moving on, uh, Ms. Buff, you can go to the next slide. So examples of accommodating employees with epilepsy. So proper accommodation can look like training other employees on how to handle a seizure, um, allowing an employee to return home after a seizure, and allowing an employee to work a consistent schedule um, so that they may take their medication. And some of these or these principles um, just kind of come out of some case law, which I'll quickly go over. So in uh, D'Souza versus Joshua Greek, uh, Creek Golf and Tennis, um, this was a case where the employee was a, a tennis pro who uh, would teach tennis to uh, clients of the club um, who had um, three seizures. Um, and as one of the accommodation or one of the requests by the employer, they requested that this employee um, essentially teach all the other employees as well as everyone else they encounter on how to handle a potential seizure. Um, in this case, um, the tribunal found that the employer failed to accommodate the employee because he because the employer expected the employee to educate his colleagues and as well as the clients on what to do if they have a seizure. Um, it would have been appropriate for the employee to train the employees on what to do in this scenario. Uh, moving on to uh, another case, which is Brighton v. General Motors of Canada. Um, this is a 2012 human rights case. Um, this is where we get the principle of allowing an employee to return home after a seizure. So this was, in this case, um, it was an instance where the employee had a seizure at work. The employee would previously, had previously had seizures at work, and when this occurred, he'd go to the nurse's room that they had there and lay down until he was ready to work. On this occasion, um, uh, when he said that he was kind of read, ready to return home after the workday, after having a seizure, um, the employer forcibly prevented him from leaving um, and even called the police and physically restrained him. Um, and the, uh, the Human Rights Tribunal found that that was a failure on behalf of the employer to accommodate the employee um, because they effectively barred him from leaving the workplace after a seizure. Um, the last case I'll mention regarding epilepsy is uh, Thompson v. a uh, numbered corporation. I, um, and in this case, um, the employer failed to accommodate the employee when she requested regular shifts so that she may, be, may consistently take her seizure medication. Um, the employer requested that she required med provide medical documentation so that she would not have a seizure at work. 
um, and would not schedule her until she provided such documentation. So in this situation, the employee had actually never had a seizure at work. She was just off sick for a few days um, and then made a request regarding accommodation. Um, and uh, in effect, in effect, there was no reason why she could not work her regular shifts. Um, she just made a request and the employer did not engage in the accommodation in that process at all. Um, they effectively just took her off the schedule there. So that was a, a clear breach um, of the employer's obligations under the code. Okay, uh, next I'll move on to just talking about undue hardship a little bit and what that means for employers. So there is no right to accommodate an employee beyond the point of undue hardship on the employer. So this is an objective and quantifiable basis. And effectively, you're, you're looking at the cost of imposing this uh, accommodation and as well as health and safety issues. So, of course, here, some hardship is to be expected for employers. Schedules have to be changed, time off granted. It's when we reach the point of undue hardship. That's the limit on the accommodation. So uh, undue hardship is determined objectively on a case-by-case -case basis. What is undue hardship for a small employer may not be undue hardship for a large employer because a large employer will have significantly more resources as compared to say a mom and pop shop where they're just hiring one employee. Um, in, in regards to undue hardship, um, the costs must be so substantial that it affects the nature or viability of the business. So some examples we can see is that making significant modifications to a phys physical workplace, such as new construction, this goes beyond say adjustments at, at a desk. Um, and of course, uh, when looking at health and safety implications, um, the onus is on the employer to take all reasonable precautions to avoid a workplace hazard. Some employees just cannot be accommodated in a safety sensitive position. The risk of injury or death to an employee or anyone else in the workplace is a significant factor that employers take into consideration. Um, in making this ex assessment, you look at the likelihood of risk and of course the severity of the harm that could occur. All right, uh, Ms. Buff, you want to move to the next si slide um, on frustration of employment. So frustration is an intervening event that makes a contract impossible to perform that is not the fault of either party to a contract and was not anticipated when the contract was made. Um, so the employment can be, uh, or an employee's employment, employment can be frustrated due to injury or illness. So under a regulation under the ESA, the employee is normally still entitled to notice of termination and severance pay under the Employment Standards Act. Um, employments will not be frustrated if it would disentitle an employee from group insurance benefits. Um, so essentially, when accommodation is not possible, employment is frustrated. Um, but frustration of employment is not a termination of employment. But the in but the in Ontario, um, as I mentioned, that the employee is entitled to notice of termination and severance under the ESA if frustration is due to injury or illness. So typically, uh, the employer will need med medical information that the employee cannot perform the essential duties uh, with or without accommodation in the foreseeable future. Um, but if frustration of employment would disentitle the employee to eligibility for group insurance benefits they could get due to their disability, they cannot be considered frustrated. So essentially where you have um, sort of long-term benefits there, um, it, an employer is not going to establish frustration right off the bat. It, it would take typically years for that uh, to occur when you have uh, when the when the employee can still access benefits. Okay, uh, just moving on to the next one. Um, yeah, and I'll just kind of briefly discuss two cases here. So this is instances where adjudicator has found employees failure to accommodate uh, employees with episodic disability. Um, so in Phillips v. Richie Smith feeds, um, this was a case where the employee was a truck driver um, for a plant that produced uh, feed for farms. So his responsibility as a truck driver was to essentially drive to a farm and deliver and unload the feed and, and drive back. 
Uh, one day he, uh, well, in his personal vehicle on his way to work, he was in a car accident. Um, as a result, he had a uh, chronic injury to his neck um, and it affected his ability to perform work. Um, and he was, of course, employed there for, or he was employed there for 22 years. So we're dealing with a large, uh, a long service employee here. Um, there was a back and forth exchange of medical info. Um, but however, after 13 months, the employer terminated the employee on the basis that it appeared that the employee would not be able to return to his position as a truck driver in the foreseeable future. Uh, the tribunal found that the standard driving the truck loads of feed and of course unloading and loading that um, as, as part of his position was rationally co connected to the purpose of his job and it was a standard adopted by the employer in good faith. However, the employer did not establish that it was impossible to accommodate the complainant to the point of undue hardship. In particular, the employer did not follow procedures to see if the employee could be accommodated in another position. Um, interestingly, this was also an employee who, um, uh, on a part-time basis, would work as a ditch better, uh, dispatcher for the company. I believe it was on a, a Saturday, uh, every few Saturdays he would do that. Um, so it, it was essentially speculation on behalf of the employer that this employee would not be, uh, could not be accommodated. And they didn't really engage in the process of understanding what his individual needs were and what accommodations were potentially available to him. Um, and the tribunal found that the truck driver could perform the dispatcher job on a part-time basis. Um, and the last case here is just, uh, it's Ottawa Carleton Public Employees Union, local 503 versus the city of Ottawa. This is a case from 2019, uh, grievance arbitration case. Um, so this is a, a, a case with a long and complex facts. Essentially, there was a lot of back and forth regard between the employee and the union or employee union and the employer regarding accommodation of the employee. The uh, employee had been previously terminated and then reinstated uh, multiple times, I believe. Um, but really, I think what the key takeaway for, from this case for the employer is the fact that even though the, uh, even though the arbitrator found that um, the union and even the employee was uncooperative at times, the city's efforts uh, made very limited efforts to contact the employee with a disability prior to actually dismissing them. Um, and then this was an extended period of time um, that this occurred over. Um, and this was interesting because even then there, were, there was the recognition that both the employee and the union uh, were not cooperative in this process as, of course, the accommodation went on over a period of years. But, but however, that did not discharge the employer from their uh, duty to accommodate and to actually engage in the ac accommodation process. And I think that that's all we have, unless Ms. But there's anything else that you want to add. So we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. So we have some questions. And one of the uh, questions that came up was um, that they noticed on their slides, you didn't mention long COVID. Is there, um, and especially with episodic disabilities that cause extreme fatigue, pain, brain fog and anxiety. Yeah. Is that still covered or is that just a... So, so of course, with long COVID, um, it's going to vary the effects to each employee, right? So it, it, every case is done on, uh, uh, or every case needs to be visited on an individual basis. So of course, even though we're dealing with episodic uh, disabilities here, the principles of accommodation are still the same. So if, a, if an employee is dealing with long COVID, we, you, the employer um, would have to engage in that accommodation process with them. That would, of course, start with, um, you know, the employees saying that they are, are requesting accommodation. Um, of course, the employer is not entitled to the diagnosis, but is entitled to know just kind of the, the general nature of it. And of course, importantly, the uh, limitations and restrictions. So knowing what they can and cannot do. So when dealing with long COVID, that's essentially the process that you would go through with the employee. Okay, so they would say that the, they they require accommodation. Um, you would need some sort of medical documentation saying what their restrictions and limitations are. 
Um, and then you go through the process of, you know, whether or not the uh, employer can do that to the point of undue hardship. You know, um, you know, is it something where, OK, uh, we need to start implementing, say, half days or they work from home on these days or, you know, reducing them to, to part time and uh, and doing these other sort of measures that can be taken by employers, right? There, there's a, and typically for larger employers, there's going to be a lot more available to them, what they can do than say smaller employers. So switching from uh, employers, I, someone's asked, I thought in federal government, the managers aren't allowed to ask health questions. So you, uh, again, you can't ask what the person's diagnosis is, but whenever you're doing any sort of accommodation, that's when you have to actually look at what their uh, restrictions and limitations are. Okay, next question is, I went on and off work for a period of five years, in 2023 to 2018. I ran into an issue that I had to fight about based on some of what was, what you're saying. I had a functional analysis done when I was not having a flare up in my illness. When I had to leave work permanently, I had to see a lawyer because they said that my functional analysis indicated that I could I could do my duties of my job. I had to threaten a human rights lawsuit based on definition of disability in the human rights code. How do functional analysis fall into the law? So in this particular situation, um, also understand that we can't give legal advice uh, we can only really provide legal information. So I can't go too much into that that individual's details there. But where a functional analysis fits in is that's typically what's relied on. Um, oftentimes at the functional ability forms, which actually outlines the employee's restrictions and limitations. So that's what actually provides the um, employer with what they need to know in order to make the accommodation. Okay. I would also like to ask for medical information before granting an accommodation. I would, oh, sorry, I also, I always ask for medical information before granting an accommodation. Some employees feel that this is onerous. Is there any reason why I can't insist on requiring medical information, not the diagnosis? So if, if an employee is saying that they require accommodation due to a medical condition, it, you can then require that they show some evidence of that. You can require that, again, of, of course, you can't know, you're not, an employer's not entitled to the diagnosis. But if they're asking for accommodation, then you're entitled to know, okay, so what, what are their, their limitations and restrictions? Because again, a employee is entitled to reasonable and not perfect or their preferred accommodation. Okay, and I'm going to pass it back to Melissa. Keep us on time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for all the engagement. I know that um, Jacob and Mizba have shared their email addresses. Um, there may be some opportunity to ask them questions that way. Um, my apologies. We are running a little bit late today. So thank you all for your questions and engagement, as well as thank you, Jacob and Mizba, for all of your information. Um, it is always really useful to hear things from the employee side so that we can provide from the employer side so that we can provide that kind of information um, for the folks who are attending from that particular group. Okay. Great. Thank you for having us. Thank you.